Hello, I'm Matthew. I'm the lead pastor here at Cedar Ridge. Thanks so much for joining us uh, for this first installment in our new series called Church to Go. Um, we, we've done this series a little bit differently. We're still having our Zoom gatherings on Sunday mornings, but we also realize that people are traveling, uh, taking advantage of the easing of restrictions with the pandemic, and I hope you're enjoying doing that, um, going on vacation, uh, taking weekends out, that kind of thing. Um, so we've um, also created options um, that hopefully are very user-friendly while you're on the go. Um, so this video, and you'll see in, in uh, the link below, there are um, some prayer exercises for this week and uh, a guided meditation you can uh, connect to. So take full advantage of that, especially if you're not able to make it to the Zoom meeting on Sundays. Um, the topic for this series, it's just a three-week series, is um, worship and prayer, two kind of staples of uh, religious life, spiritual life. Um, and uh, as we explore those today, we're going to look at um, a fact, an issue that I think affects those very significantly, and that is um, how do we experience God? You know, what, what, it, how do we think and feel about God? Um, because that's going to really impact how and why we pray and how and why we worship. Right? What we think about God will really inform those two practices. And um, I think in many respects, how we think about God has been. Uh, shaken and rocked with what we've been through over the last 18 months. I mean, you know, we've, we've all struggled in different ways, some very acutely. I mean, there's been a, so much pain and loss, and that raises all kinds of questions. So as we explore this issue today, I wanted to uh, share a story of my own, not from uh, the pandemic, but from many years ago, back when I was practicing medicine. You know, I, I eventually went into pediatrics, but as a very junior doctor, I worked in an adult emergency room. Uh, for a while and uh, a patient came in who had this big um, infected cyst on their back um, pr pretty nasty um, and I needed to uh, drain it and so um, a gentleman about 70 years old and so I'm putting the local anesthetic in and it wasn't really working that often happens when when an area like that is infected but I kept checking to see if he was numb and he eventually said look you know stop injecting me just get on with it I've got a high pain threshold so I asked him about uh, uh, you know well, why's that? You know, and he proceeded to tell me that um, he was a prisoner of war during the Second World War. He was um, conscripted into the British Army, flown in behind enemy lines uh, in, in France, captured and put in a, a, a German prisoner of war camp and treated really badly. Um, and, you know, he didn't go into a huge amount of detail, but it was pretty clear he was abused. He was tortured. Um, he, a lot of pain was inflicted on him. So relatively, this uh, uh, procedure that I was doing was was not on a par with that. Um, but he told me a little bit about his experience in, in the prison of war camp, and he he became friends with a, another British guy in that um, uh, a POW camp, and they both escaped together. Um, but they were in France; it was occupied by the by the German army, and they were captured again, taken back. Um, and this happened three or four times; they managed to escape and would get recaptured. But eventually. They, they were so desperate, they, they made one final attempt and they managed to get to the French resistance who took them to northern France, to the coast there, and they were able to get across the English Channel to Dover. And then from Dover, they um, took a train uh, to London uh, and, and got to Victoria Station in London. And they were obviously really looking forward to seeing their families. Um, they had to report in first, of course. Um, but um, they came out of Victoria Station and one of those uh, big, famous, red London double-decker buses came around the corner and hit his friend and killed him outright in an instant. And that's a pretty shocking story, right? Um, I was shocked. I was speechless. I, 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 I just, it, it was un, un, unimaginable, inconceivable that something like that would happen. And it raises so many existential questions, right? What, what is the nature of the universe? What's the meaning of life? For people of faith, it, it begs the question, where is God in all that? I mean, okay, I get wars, uh, uh, you know, that, that's humanity at its worst, but, but these are two guys that have endured and persevered and been abused, but they've, they've got through and they've not given up and then they get knocked down by a bus. I mean, that... That's so random. It, it, it just uh, it begs all these questions. And I was a person of faith at the time. I was a person of very shaky faith, I would say. And that really made me think, gosh, what, what is the nature of God? And it's this question, is, is God in control? Uh, is, is, is God in control and actually not that concerned, not that loving? Or is God not in control? Um, and then what's the point of God if God's not in control? We, it, 
a question that we've looked at uh, many times before, a question that we all ask ourselves, I think, a lot, especially when we've gone through difficult circumstances, because I've just shared one story, but we've all had experiences. We've all got stories like that. Um, and so we're going to look at that question today. And um, I think it's important we don't ignore it, especially as we talk about prayer and wor worship later in the service, because you know, there's, there's different ways of responding to it. One is, of course, to say, well, yeah, see, there's no God. There can't be a God. That's one way. Um, and I've certainly wrestled with that myself. Um, I just can't ignore the fact that uh, I have also many experiences and uh, and there's, for me, there's so much other evidence that God is good and beautiful and loving. Um, and I just can't ignore that. Um, but so we, another way of responding to it is, is just to sort of ignore it, pretend it's not there, that we, we, we're conflicted, but we kind of deny the conflict. But it sort of simmers away in there, I think, and denial is never a healthy thing. Uh, another way we, we deal with it is to say, well, I don't understand it, but God's God, so God can do whatever God wants. And, you know, in a way that sounds quite pious, quite spiritual, quite submissive to God, but we wouldn't let anyone else uh, act like that. And it feels like, I think often we, we, we sort of internalize this mistrust of God and it affects us emotionally and psychologically. And um, so we just want to open this up, like what, how, we're not going to solve it today, but you know, I, I don't think we would solve it if we talked about this for a hundred years. But we just want to open it up and be honest about it. And um, uh, to do that, I want to just um, think again, as we've done before, about the issue of the mystery of God and metaphors. We have metaphors that help us understand this mystery of God, um, and you know that they're really helpful for us. Um, we say God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Uh, God is three and one. Those are metaphors that really can be really, really helpful and, and very um, uh, empowering in many respects. But they're still only metaphors. And you know what we think when we say Father, and what we think when we say Son, uh, and when what we think when we say Holy Spirit it, uh, are very different. Right? We all have different feelings and thoughts about those words, and 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 we may not even use the same words all the time. Uh, we all have different metaphors that we use, but when we say God the Son, it's not Son like I, I have two sons, but it's we're talking about something very different. It's a way to try to describe something about God, but it's not it's not exactly like the metaphor itself. So the metaphors are limited, in other words, and also the metaphors are very human because we, by definition, we take them from our human experience. That's why they're helpful. But then the danger is that we project that humanity onto God and then we end up creating God in our own image. And, um, and I think that's what's happened with many of our metaphors. And um, sometimes they're so embedded that we don't even realize they're metaphors. And I, I think there's a, a metaphor for God that perhaps doesn't get spoken about, but it's just there embedded in our thinking, embedded in our feeling. And it's the God is a strong man kind of metaphor. In other words, God is in charge of the universe God is all powerful, controlling, has control over all circumstances, all the elements, everything. That's what defines God. That if, if there's a God, then God's like that. Um, and it's, I, I say the strong man, uh, call it a strong man metaphor, because it's based, I think, in many respects, on um, how hu humanity has evolved. You know, we, uh, it, for primitive man, it made sense that God would be that kind of a God, because when you look at how we conduct ourselves in society, especially in those days, and even now, it's based on the powerful and the and the influential and the successful. They they control everything, and and in fact, their ability to control the circumstances, whether it's because of their physical prowess, uh, perhaps that was more the case in in ages gone by, or their intellectual prowess, or their money, or their, whatever it is, it's their ability to control circumstances, which which means they have power. That's what defines them. That's what defines leadership. That's what defines power. And, and you know, it, that can be, it means you have to be subservient to that person. You have to obey that person, do what they say, or, um, but you also get protection from that person. And, and so, the, you know, our, I think our understanding of God has evolved in that kind of paradigm with that kind of metaphor. Um, and it's, it's, um, it's not in, a, in and of itself uh, wrong or harmful is just it's it's imbalance it's a very masculine view of God again nothing wrong with being masculine it's just that if that's the only way we see God um, and 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 people like that so ma people masculine people like that um, are, are the ones with power 
it's imbalanced, right? It's we and we've we've I think lost that sense of balance, and and it, it, even in the way that we think about God. So I want to sort of pose some other ways of that we might look at God, um, and. The, I want to make three points, um, but really, and they're going to appear on the on the um, uh, screen as statements, and they're in the in the uh, link below. But really, I'm asking them as questions, um, and you know, do, we're going to explore these over the next few weeks. And I encourage you to just reflect on them and think about them yourself. Um, first one is this: um, What if divine power is best understood as love and willingness to be vulnerable rather than control? Um, so have we just almost set God up for failure? Because we've said, okay, if there's a God, God's got to be in control, but in control in the way that we think about human control, uh, controlling all the circumstances. I mean, that's how we tend to define human power. What if God's power is nothing to do with that? What if control is not a quality, not a property of deity? What if we're um, asking the wrong question? You know, like asking, is God in control of every circumstance is like, asking is God purple is like not really a relevant question it's just so relevant to us because of our human understanding of power and our, I, I think our human desire for power both to exercise power and also to um, to have someone who is in control who's on our side we want that protection we want that brings us a sense of security so kind of letting go of that or thinking about God not necessarily being in control in that kind of way might feel kind of scary to us um, so here's the second question. What if the best way to understand God is to look at Jesus? And I think in Jesus, you know, by the way, that's probably not such a radical question, right? Because as followers of Jesus, as people in the Christian tradition, that's what we would say. We, we, we look at Jesus to see God. Um, but when we look at Jesus's life, Jesus is, I, I don't think we can define Jesus's life by power and control. We define it by love and vulnerability. Uh, Jesus is a servant. Jesus is a compassionate presence to people. Jesus is not controlling people. Jesus is inviting people, uh, inviting people into this way of love and, and actually letting people go as well. Um, not trying to manipulate and control people in that respect. Jesus is willing to have people around him who he knows are going to let him down. Uh, people who are going to betray him. Um, Jesus is willing to love people even to the, to, the, to the point where it costs him his life. There's an incredible vulnerability to Jesus. Now, some would say, and I, 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 I'm not saying I, I uh, disagree with this, but some would say Jesus is uh, choosing not to be in control. You know, and, and certainly there's scriptures like Jesus could call down armies from heaven. And, and, and um, there was, you know, there's things that could, uh, in scripture, that could certainly... Um, lead us to think that Jesus was actually had a lot of power that he just chose not to um, to use. But at the same time, I think we're probably a little uncomfortable with the amount of lack of control that Jesus had, how, just how vulnerable he was. I mean, our faith, if you like, our, 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 our religion is defined by the, the death and resurrection of Jesus, it, but defined by love, even to the point of death. And if you also, if you think about it, Jesus was born as a baby. A, a baby is the ultimate in vulnerability. A, a baby has virtually zero control o, over its environment, even over its own bodily functions, and is dependent on, um, in Jesus' case, Mary and Joseph to uh, nurture and support and protect and so that's like god saying i'm going to i'm going to commit myself into your hands um it's it, it's it's a huge reversal i'm going to trust you for protection um that's the degree of lack of control if you like the degree of vulnerability um that defines god um let's look at a couple of scriptures um where jesus prays and worships and uh, which i think kind of um get at this issue Firstly, in Matthew chapter 11, Jesus says, At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and to those whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. 
So just a few things about this. Firstly, it sort of sounds a bit exclusive. You know, it sounds like, well, God's kind of like reveals to these people and not to those people. That feels a bit unfair. But really what Jesus is saying here is, look, if you think God is all about power and control, if you are powerful and controlling, it's going to be really hard for you to understand God. Um, to get God, you need to be innocent like a child. You need to be vulnerable like a child because that's the nature of God. And um, that's just turned everything on its head, I think. I think Jesus is telling us that God isn't what you really think. Um, and perhaps religion has become so powerful and controlling and manipulative because we think that's what God's like. But it turns out that God's not like that. And Jesus is inviting us to participate in a, a faith journey, to participate in an adventure that is um, very vulnerable. It's all about love. Um, it's not about controlling and manipulating people, but rather loving and supporting and nurturing people. And that's why Jesus says, come to me, all you are weary and heavy burdened. Jesus is, is calling, um, if you like, like-minded people, people who are like Jesus, who are saying, I, I, I'm, I'm going to define myself by love. Uh, rather by, than by power and control. Um, and Jesus talks here about, the, about us being one, right? He talks about the, the, the Father and the Son being one, and, and it's the Son and the Father being one. And elsewhere, it talks about us being one with the Father and with the Son. And this, this invitation is, is an invitation to participate in this non-controlling, non-manipulative nature of God, this ultimate love. Um, you know, our oneness with God is not like just being on the same page as God or agreeing with God, but it's we are part of God and God is part of us. We are part of this whole thing already. Um, and if we could just understand that, if we could, if we could if, uh, be enlightened to that degree, we wouldn't need uh, to be the, the sort of uh, the the security, if you like, for our identity of knowing that there's a really authoritative uh, um, uh, male figure out there who, who controls the universe, and that's, that's, gonna, that's where we get our confidence from, but rather that we belong. We, we're part of this, uh, this um, uh, deity that is defined by love already. Um, Matthew chapter 6, uh, Jesus in, in this chapter famously teaches us how to pray and says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Um, so Jesus is implying God's will isn't always being done. Like God isn't controlling all the outcomes because we, we, we're meant to pray that God's will would happen. That infers that it's not always happening. Um, and then later in, in, um, uh, later on in Jesus' life, in Mark chapter 14, he's about to go to his death and he prays, Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. In other words, Jesus is, I think, a couple of things happening here. He's, he's, in both those passages, he's using a male metaphor for God again. He did in the previous one too. So there's, you know, it's, um, you know, but it's a different metaphor. It's, a, it's Abba. It's this Aramaic term for God, which is so intimate and gentle. It's, it's, it's a much softer um, metaphor than a, a, a controlling patriarchal figure. Um, and he, Jesus is saying to us, that's what God is like, uh, using that metaphor. Um, but Jesus is also saying that we are invited to participate with God in the way of God being accomplished. In other words, it's not going to be brought about by power and control, manipulation. It's being brought about by love and our cooperation with that. And that means suffering. It means pain, just as Jesus experienced, because it doesn't always work out immediately, and uh, and there's a there's implicit in this is a huge amount of vulnerability, a huge amount of risk. But Jesus, modelling that himself, invites us into that kind of connection, that kind of intimate connection um, to God and with God. Um, so I want to leave you with the last uh, point or the last question, which we'll explore further as we go through this series, which is what if prayer and worship are ways we experience intimacy with the divine mystery and join in with God's flow of love in a very personal way? Um, in other words, prayer is not about trying to get an all-powerful being to do what we want them to do, to get the outcomes we want. Um, worship is not about placating an all-powerful being, um, uh, you know, to keep them on our side or to keep them happy. 
but rather it's about their expressions of our connection, their ways in which we, we experience that intimate connection and flow with God's love in, into this world in a deeper and a more, more profound way. I hope that has been helpful in some way. I know I've asked more questions than, than provided answers, but let's all take um, some time to explore these issues. How are we feeling about them? How do they impact our own lives in terms of how we behave, how we worship, how we pray? Um, the, do the prayer exercises in the link below and, and, and the guided meditation, and then let's come back together again next week and we'll talk about prayer. Thanks.